I would like to introduce then Kat Hien. Uh, yes, I tried. <laughs> you did uh, well. <laughs> yay. Uh, she works at Monzo uh, in the financial crime team. Uh, between her interests are automating all the things, uh, sorting out legacy code, making things simple and faster. And she's the next co-organizer of PHP Southwest. And now she's currently organizing, co-organizing London Gophers. And she, she also cycles across Europe with tech bikers to raise, to raise money for Room to Read, which is a charity um, that uh, I think uh, helps literacy in children. Yeah, they build libraries in developing countries. Yeah, and her charity of choice here is, uh, oh no, I forgot the name. <laughs> oh, Offset, uh, Offset Earth. <laughs> Offset Earth. Uh, that it's basically, uh, you can plant trees and you can, you, you should probably explain it. Uh, you will think better. Uh, yeah, you can basically offset your carbon emissions uh, by donating money to the charity and then they plant trees in places like Madagascar uh, in unused plants, also giving employment to local people. So win-win for everyone and for the planet. <laughs> Particularly. Um, well, her, her talk would be on how to structure your microservices, a topic we all love, <laughs> or at least the majority. <laughs> um, so many, like so many things I, I, I had with, so many changes I had personally with how I structure my microservices that have been, uh, you can see like in the in my work evolution, how, how they have changed and I think it holds <laughs> true for everyone. So uh -huh. you can start with your, uh, with your talk now. Cool, thank you. Uh, let me just do the screen swapsies. Um, Hopefully that's all, uh, all looks good. Um, all right, so hello everyone, um, I am Kat. Um, thank you for joining online today for this talk. Um, some of you may know me from a talk I gave a while ago called how to structure your Go apps. Uh, and that talk was mostly about how the layout of a single Go application, or rather than um, I talked about a few different ways that you could structure a single Go application, but oftentimes, Life is a little more complicated than that, um, and that's when things start to get a bit tricky. Because on one hand, you could just keep adding to your hexagonal or MVC structure, and maybe they could still work and make sense to you, even if they have hundreds or thousands of files in there. Um, but very often, they don't work as well, and things quickly turn into an ugly mess of spaghetti code and lots of interdependent or duplicated logic. Uh, and adding a new thing to that mess seems next to impossible, and your confidence in the whole thing is at an all-time low. Um, I've certainly seen this dark side of software development, and a few years ago, I started to be intrigued by this concept of microservices. It seemed good to me on paper, uh, but I wanted to see how to actually make it work in practice. And similarly, how I talked about the rules of structuring your app to try and find the holy grail, um, I also wanted to identify some golden rules of building a system uh, that is composed of microservices. Now, I know what you're thinking. Oh my God, another buzzword, microservices is such a fad. Um, one of my favorite quotes was from Andrew Schaefer, who once said that everyone wants to continuously DevOps microservices these days. Um, and I can see why some, some people have to have an aversion to microservices. Um, it is pretty easy to get burned by microservices gone wrong. Um, but the more I saw and heard people talk about microservices, the more I thought that people don't actually have a good understanding of what they are and how they should be used. Case in point, a while ago, uh, we shared a blog post at Monzo, uh, which mentioned that we have over 1,500 microservices in our system, and it freaked people out. We got a lot of funny replies saying that this is ridiculous, asking why on earth would we need that many, stating that clearly something some, somewhere has gone wrong and that this must be impossible to maintain and work on and so on. And yet, we run a bank on that a fully licensed, a fully regulated bank in the UK with over 4 million customers, so not a small feat. We have to be fast, we have to be secure, we have to be scalable. We have to have minimal to no downtime, ideally, at least at the very least around payment processing, because who needs a bank whose cards don't work? So why on earth would we stake all that on the microservice architecture if we didn't have any confidence in it? Well, it works for us. 
And it can work for a lot of people. Um, of course, it's not a silver, silver bullet and not for every single use case out there. But if done well, microservices can sometimes be the only viable way forward. Provided, of course, that you have a good understanding of what a microservice actually is. So let's start with that. Think of the human body as an analogy. You can think of the whole body as a monolith, right? And the human body is composed of many body parts, like the head and the arm and the leg and the toe and the feet and, and so on. And a lot of people think that those body parts are, are the equivalents of microservices. But this is where they are wrong, because that leads to more like microliths over time. If you think about it, those body parts are still fairly complicated themselves, and they're still too big. So what I'm talking about here is the truly micro level, like down to the atoms and cells and organs and muscles and tissues and ligaments, all of that that builds the body parts, which then make up the whole body. So if you were to count how many of those truly individual bits of body, um, like those individual components make up the human body, or even just one part of the body, like the head or an arm, you would easily count over 1,500 elements. And this is exactly the thinking that you need to apply here. So think about the truly basic building blocks of your application. Let's take building a very simple bank as an example. So in a bank, we have customers who have accounts, and we have cards that are assigned to those accounts. And then we also have merchants who are on the other side of the payment networks that we need to connect to. We have transactions between the merchants and the customers. And they all, all of this revolves around money and currencies um, and all of that. And those things are not only just related to the bank, they are related to each other too. Um, and you can see that there's a lot of de dependencies, even in, in just this simple example, like the cards are used to spend money that it gets taken from an account and then assigned to a transaction. So there is a lot of different, a lot of dependencies between all of those singular elements. This is exactly what happened in practice at Monzo. Those diagrams showed the actual Monzo network of over 1500 microservices. The right one is, uh, it shows services colored by the team. Uh, and we also removed a few popular nodes from that diagram just to make it clear. Uh, you can read more about this on the blog that I mentioned. I put a link on the slides as well. So this is just to illustrate the point that you really need to adopt a very different way of thinking when building a system based on microservices. If you were to design a monolithic version of the bank, then you'd probably imagine a Vestige API with something like, a, with, with endpoints like a get or post a transaction, or maybe a get or a post or delete a customer, or maybe a put account. But over time, this would grow to tens or hundreds of endpoints, and a lot of the logic would end up being intertwined, duplicated, or untestable or, or unreachable. So microservices provide an alternative to that. They have their downsides, of course, but they're also a pretty solid choice for large systems. Uh, Netflix is another good example of, of um, using microservices successfully. There are some ground rules without which everything would quickly become a mess. Um, to me, the main rule is that everything should be the same. So I highly recommend using the same language for all your microservices, keeping your, your services in the same code base, so using them on a repo, um, using the same service structure for every single one of your services. So this could be hexagonal architecture or whatever other architecture um, you pick. But as long as it's the same in all services, you should have the same way of deploying and testing those services. Pretty much, you should have the same everything. Um, this helps to keep things simple, because you can focus on making one thing work, work really well, rather than spend your energy maintaining a few different ways of doing exactly the same thing for no good reason. Um, you can even go a step further and you can auto-generate a new service using templating. So you can have a script that you run every time you, you want to add a new service to your fleet. And that speeds up the process a lot. The advantages of sticking to this everything should be the same rule is that you'll find your way around the whole code base much quicker. And you'll know roughly where to expect everything to be in every service, even if you're not familiar with it. Because as long as you know the structure, you know where to look for handlers, you know, you know where to look for the database structure and so on. So this helps with code, with code based exploration, especially once you get to thousands of services. Embrace the libraries. Um, it goes without saying that you shouldn't reinvent the wheels every time you write a new microservice. Um, and most of the bootstrapping functionality like routing or authentication or logging, et cetera, et cetera, can all be reused across all the services and just imported as libraries. 
So they're really just packages that you can include every service automatically when you generate your code. And because all the services will use the same things, you'll get constant behavior across your entire system. And you will only need to maintain one library rather than support 10 different implementations of something. And then somehow, for example, make all the different logging styles work with each other when you try to aggregate them. For example, every service at Monzo comes, up, comes set up with a Typhoon router out of the box. Typhoon is just a wrapper around the standard uh, net HTTP library from Go. It's also available on GitHub and on open source if you want to check it out. Um, and I deliberately didn't blow up this code too much inside because it's not really important what this code does. The point that I want to make is that in blue, I highlighted all the bits that you can auto generate for every server service and don't need to type them by hand. So it's things like including the import statements or just initializing the router or just kicking it off and calling serve on it. All those things you can do automatically for every service because every service will need it. And then what you actually need to write by hand is the interesting part, so the logic. So that's the, the two red boxes. In the smaller one, we just define the root um, for a ping. And then on the left, we define a handler for it. So in this case, it's just a simple return a pong in the response. Um, but that's actually the interesting part, that you it's the fun part of writing microservices. And by auto-generating a lot of the boilerplate code, you just sort of keep the fun to yourself, and you don't get bogged down by all the cumbersome um, re like re process of repeating the same things over and over again for every service. And auto-generation is, I would say, the only way to go fast with microservices. Otherwise, it would take you forever to write all of this by hand. And it's not just the plumbing that you can extract into services. Um, things like money is a good example of some of the domain consideration that you can abstract away and make sure that they are understood consistently across the entire system. For example, how you represent monetary values. Um, in, this, in this example, we use a big int for that. Um, things like how many decimal points do you consider? What's the rounding logic? How do you attach currency information to an amount? How do you represent an amount? What decimal mark you use and so on? I would recommend doing this for all the critical elements for your domain. Um, the advantage of this is that you only need to maintain this one library rather than support 10 different implementations. And you can put all your energy into writing good unit tests for just this one package and make sure it's tested really well. And because you will use the same libraries in all your services, you get consistent behavior across all of them, which is very important with, which dealing with, when dealing with things like money, um, where you could end up with different and sometimes inconsistent implementations of the rounding logic, for example, um, and they're all in different places of the code base. Sometimes it is even necessary because things like authentication should work exactly the same across all services. The implications of not doing that or forgetting to include authentication could be quite severe. So now we've covered the three golden rules, uh, thinking on a truly micro level, keeping things identical as much as possible, and sharing the common code as libraries. There is a lot more to be said about building microservices successfully. So here are some of my favorite gems, uh, gems of wisdom that I picked up from my, from my amazing coworkers over time. I take no credit for, for uh, any of this. Responsibility. Um, deciding when something should be its own microservice can be really tricky sometimes, uh, especially without lots of practice under your belt. And this is probably the biggest struggle that I've seen people have with microservices and probably why so many people have been disappointed with that idea. If you get it wrong, you'll end up with a bad system that just feels more broken than if it were a legacy monolith. So it is important to take your time at the design stage to get things right. For me, the best principle was that each service should have its own single, clearly defined area of responsibility that feels almost atomic in nature. And this area of responsibility cannot be shared by multiple services. So for example, one service returning results and one service saving results is a bad split. There should be just one service doing both and anything else that concerns that particular area of your domain that the service is responsible for. Each service should have its own data store, which is not shared with any other services. And this doesn't necessarily mean a separate database for each microservice, but it could mean that each table in your database is owned by one and only service and only that service can access that table. And this will guarantee consistency and accuracy of your data, and it will prevent lots of unforeseen surprise, surprises down the line. And if you stick to the simple rule, you will make your life 100 times easier. I think that this is the only way forward when you work on a system with thousands of services, and you only know about 10 or 20% of them well. You want your service to own everything about their domain, and you want other services to come to your service when they need something from your services domain. 
Services should be designed so that they can be treated as black boxes. You just need to understand and use their exposed API interface to get your job done. And you shouldn't really need to know anything about their internals. For example, if I have a service that deals with the process of customer sign up, and I need to activate a customer's bank account, uh, bank card as part of the process, then the customer sign up service should send a request to the card service to activate, activate a particular card, rather than try and do that activation as part of the sign up process. Finding that line of division is tricky sometimes, but I think with practice, you can develop a really good sense for it. Keep your services small. I would say anything between two and maybe like 10 to 15 business operations is a good number for a single service. In practical terms, that means that your microservice will typically have between two to 15 API endpoints. Anything more, and you should consider breaking it up into smaller parts, if at all possible, unless you have a really, really good reason not to. Even if it seems like an overkill, breaking things down help you, helps you keep things simple. And you're in the land of microservices. You should get comfortable with the idea of having many, many services. It's not the time to skimp on services. Build extensible, not flexible systems. This is one of my favorite rules. Um, those two words might sound like the same, but there, there is a very subtle difference between them. And the difference is about how you ask the question. You could ask, can this system support this functionality in the future? Or you can ask, can the system be extended to support this functionality in the future? If you're building flexible systems, you have to predict the future and guess some, how something will work then. And very often, you either don't have enough information at present to make an informed decision, so you'll end up with lots of assumptions in your code, or you might end up optimizing for something that never ends up being Im implemented. And now your code isn't as simple as it could have been because of all the extra use cases that you were trying to cater for. And that's why it's better to aim for extensible systems. So something that supports the current needs well, but can be easily tweaked or extended to support more use cases in the future. It's a pretty abstract concept and it comes with practice again, um, but I think it's a really good guiding, guiding principle. As an example, think about a Lego piece that you've seen used in a variety of ways. Did the designers of that Lego piece predict all those use cases up front to try and be flexible? No, of course not. But did they design the piece so that it can be clicked, clipped to or clipped on another piece in a variety of ways? Yes, and that's the extensibility that we're talking about here. The rule of three. If you don't have at least three examples of how to solve a problem, you probably don't know enough about it to abstract it usefully. This is pretty self-explanatory, but really, don't try and predict the future. And unless you're really, really sure that the abstraction layer is a good idea, just don't do it. Duplication isn't necessarily bad if the similarity between the logic is only partial. Abstractions come with its own cost of maintenance, and they might actually severely limit you in the future if you don't get them right. Remember that they're always easier to add later on than remove down the line. Expect to grow unexpectedly. Um, the beauty of microservices is the power of extending them infinitely. Um, so take advantage of that and grow them over time, but know that you will grow in ways that you didn't anticipate. And that's okay, that's the very nature of software engineering. So expect constant change and design for it at every level. You should aim to be able to add, remove, change, or replace components of your system continuously without downtime. So a bit like plug and play. A very impo important principle to remember here is to keep your services backwards compatible. It's the only way to make sure that a large team can safely evolve the whole system over time without breaking things along the way. And as for the smooth deployments part, luckily you can use the tried and trusted ways of achieving that with the blue-green deployments or horizontal scalability and so on. A lot of those deployment best practices can be used with microservices in pretty much the same ways as you would use them with a monolith. Embrace the failures because they will happen. So design with typical networking and reliability issues in mind. Your, network, your networking will fail at some point. For example, make your endpoints idempotent whenever possible so you can automatically retry requests that fail. Also designed to limit the impact of failure when it happens. This one is really important. Prioritize the availability of the most critical functionality and isolate the problems to as few users or as few services as possible for as little time as, po as possible. For example, create event-driven systems to divide complex processes into independent chunks of work and make the most critical part of the whole process as small as possible so that the potential for it to, fa to fail is limited 
and not affected by something else failing somewhere else. Developing products iteratively helps here um, because small and iterative changes are always better than sweeping bang bang changes. And finally, learn from your past incidents. You will never be able to predict all the different possible combinations and ways in which your system could fail. So every time something does fail, make sure to put something in place to prevent that from happening again in the future. Sometimes this needs to be done across all services. So also be prepared to have a way to deploy changes across the whole fleet. Write tests to log the behavior of your services API. This one is kind of obvious. We should all be writing tests to make sure that we don't break the contracts that we started out with over time. But it's even more important in the microservice world. Um, you have thousands of services, and you can't possibly manually ensure that every one of them is still doing what you think they're doing after every small change that you make to the system. So automated tests here really are your friend. Write lots of them, and if, if you had to focus on one layer, my advice would be to test the outside, be outside behavior of each service as is observed by the con consumer of that service. So don't focus so much on testing the implementation details, but make sure that given some inputs, these are the expected outputs, and those things have happened. So for example, an event was fired when you did something. So test the observable behavior. This isn't really a new concept in testing, and it's a good practice in general. But it's especially important when working with microservices because of how much all they rely on each other and how interconnected they are. And this brings me to the last of my favorite best practices, which is the monorepo. Um, there is a very good reason for keeping the source code for all your services in one single source control repository. It will make your deployment simpler to start with because you won't have to fetch multiple sources uh, or work out the compatible version between services from different repositories. Instead, you can just heavily rely on the Go compiler to do that work for you for, most, for the most part, provided that your services are always backwards compatible, of course. Uh, when you keep all the source code in a single repository, your code will simply not compile if you've broken any interface or dependencies anywhere. For example, if your services were to expose their request and response types to the world, as you do with gRPC, for example, then the interface changes and the consumers, uh, so in, if the interface changes of the request or response and the consumers are not updated, then your code just won't compile and the compiler will scream at you. And this is why monorepos make, make large scale refactoring much easier because you just get that instant feed, feedback in a lot of cases. Having everything in one repo also allows you to avoid having to rely on dependency management too much because you'll always import services from the same branch as yours. And this is actually an additional, additional layer of protection for you because you could enforce a rule that, for example, only services from the main branch can be deployed to production. Uh, and that means that if you also enforce any merge that goes into the main branch to have gone via a pull request, then that means that you ensure that any code that is mer being merged there has been reviewed. Um, you can also deploy all the changes in one go rather than waste time repeating the whole rollout process and waiting for the pipeline to finish for every single service that is affected by your changes. And all your history of changes lives in the same place. So there's no need to waste time to piece the puzzles together for, from lots of different repositories and figure out how things changed over time. I also found that a monorepo really helps to keep many things simple. Um, it significantly reduces overhead and provides just high levels of confidence to developers. So I would highly recommend this approach other than GitHub being a bit slow for you once you get to a lot of services in there. I haven't really found any downsides. There are some exceptions to this rule, such as if you need to limit access to a particular group of services, for example, for security reasons, uh, but those are rare and you can deal with them uh, on an individual basis. And finally, a lot of people wonder how code ownership works in microservice land. Um, if you use a monorepo and if you use GitHub, you can use the code owners feature. Um, so this is where you assign a team to each, each service and then that team needs to approve any pull requests to that service. In my experience, assigning ownership is easier with microservices um, rather than the monolithic application because you can do it on a service rather than the feature level. And it's easier to limit access to groups of services that way. Now, you might be thinking if all of this is good or bad and whether microservices are worth it. As always, the answer is it depends. Um, personally, I'm a huge fan, but I wanted to fully acknowledge that microservices do come with a cost and it's not insignificant. Um, I would say microservices are an overkill for small or simple projects for which, a simple mono, for which a single monolithic application would work just fine. 
There is nothing wrong with that. And you should definitely consider the cost of running microservices when deciding on the approach that you take. Microservices will rely, require a solid, reliable, and complicated platform to run on. Most companies will use Kubernetes, some will use Docker, but either way, you have to be prepared to learn that. Have a platform to take care of all for you. Manually starting a bunch of services on your server might be okay for a demo, but it sure isn't enough for a serious production system, which has to scale dynamically. You'll need to figure out things like service discovery. So how will the services know where everybody else lives? You'll need to figure out deployments and scaling. And I can tell you that it's not a small feat. So if you want to learn that, great, but it most likely won't be worth the effort for just small and simple projects. Microservices mean many moving parts, and that may mean more difficulty tracing down bugs. Um, you also have to tackle issues that are typical for microservice systems, such as cascading failures, uh, which can suddenly take out a lot of your services at once, or retry storms, which can result in UDD OS in your own system. But I think that microservices are a viable way forward for a large, complex, serious production system. Um, I worked with monoliths in the past, and I've never been happier to more work with microservices now. They naturally keep many things simple, and any technical debt will always be broken into services. So the spaghetti code is much less likely to happen. Either way, the choice is yours, and I hope that this talk uh, will be helpful in getting you on the right track with microservices. And I wanted to leave you with uh, this quote, which is a reply to one of the tweets that we got in response to that blog post about 1500 microservices. And I think it answers the question of why microservices really well. Um, it says, because a large number of individually simple and loosely coupled systems are more resilient than a small number of individually complex and tightly coupled components. Um, and that pretty much sums it up for me. So with that, thank you for listening. Um, and I hope you enjoyed the whole conference. I know this is the last talk. Uh, you can chat to me on Twitter, um, send me any questions, and I will share the slides afterwards online. I'll post all the links to Slack and Twitter. So thank you. Thank you so much for your talk. Uh, it was really, really fun. Um, <laughs> in, we have a few questions, but I think we're already over the limit. So maybe uh, you can you can take this to sessions to um, an open networking for this uh, ten minutes. Yeah, we have left. To. And uh, we, we the lightning talks will start in ten minutes after this finish. This finishes because we have to set it up uh, still. So once again, thank you so much. Do you have any dogs? Thanks around? for having me. Uh, dogs? <laughs> no, they're in the. I kicked them out to a different room so they don't. Uh, <laughs> Too bad, but <laughs> bend them for me. <laughs> <laughs> I will do. They will definitely love it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, see you then. See you there. Bye bye.